All right. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to our monthly Bridge Michigan lunch break. Today we are discussing what's coming from Bridge Michigan in 2021. We hope this will be an interactive session, taking many questions and getting your feedback on our upcoming plans. I am Amber DeLind, I'm the membership director today, and as usual on our lunch break, I am co-hosting today with Catherine Dougal, who is our development and engagement specialist at Bridge in the Center for Michigan. If you're not, if you don't know very much about Bridge Michigan, we are Michigan's nonprofit, nonpartisan Michigan news source. You can find us at bridgemi.com. And we host monthly discussions we call lunch breaks. We've been doing these for about six months now um, over Zoom. They're one hour discussions about an important topic that's facing the state of Michigan. Uh, in the past, we've discussed racial equity in Michigan, high water levels in the Great Lakes. We focus on election questions leading up to the November election. We have talked about K-12 education in the time of COVID and also answered all of your questions about coronavirus in Michigan. Today, I want to specifically uh, give thank you to our members who are individuals who donate to our nonprofit newsroom. We can't do this work without, without your support. We're so grateful for those of you on this call who are, who are members and to all of our readers. If you are a Bridge member, I invite you to, if you're comfortable, put your, your status as a Bridge member in your, in your name on your, on your display name on the screen. Uh, today's schedule is that we will begin with an introduction um, from our special guests about the plans that Bridge Michigan has for 2021, and then we'll be turning to the questions that you submitted when you registered. We'll also be answering questions that you submit via the chat on the Zoom window uh, for today's discussion and possibly even throw questions your way to answer during the chat. We would appreciate if you stay muted through the entire uh, conversation and send us questions via that chat window. If you are joining us on the phone today, um, feel free to email your questions to me at membership at bridgemi.com. So feel free to send them to me that way if you are joining us on the phone. We are recording this discussion and we'll be posting the recording in Bridge Michigan tomorrow. So if you know someone who wanted to be here today and couldn't, you can, you'll be able to send them that video or you can watch it again if you'd so choose. Uh, I now like to introduce our special guests. We are joined today by four members of Bridge Michigan's leadership team. John Bebo is the Center for Michigan and Bridge, and Bridge Michigan's president and CEO. David Zeman is Bridge's senior editor. Joel Kurth is Bridge's managing editor. And Paul Gardner is Bridge's business editor. I'll turn it over to them, starting with John, to give you an overview of Bridge's plans for this important year. Thank you, Amber, and, and thanks for everybody for investing the time to have a lunch hour with us. Um, you'll hear it a lot from us. The, the, the most important thing I can tell you always is thank you. Bridge exists because of you and, and for readers all across the state. Um, we wake up to a reality here every morning that, that civic journalism is not dying. It is changing, and um, we are heartened by what's happening at Bridge. Um, Bridge turns 10 years old in September, and with, with a little bit of luck, maybe, we'll see, fingers crossed, we, we hope to host an awfully big birthday celebration or two, and thanks again to all of you. Um, we're heartened because all across this country, models like Bridge are developing. There are more than 100, more than 100 um, nonprofit news models um, that are all members of an organization called the Institute for Nonprofit News. It's sort of our industry trade group. Um, they're doing great work all around the country, reinvigorating civic journalism. And, and um, we're very happy to say Bridge, um, after 10 years, is one of the very largest in the country now in terms of audience. Um, this is a thrilling ride for us. Um, it's an exhausting ride. Um, we've never, like everyone else, experienced anything like 2020. Um, the silver lining here is that readers have turned to bridge in droves over the past year, um, more than a million readers a month now. Wow. It, it starts with a lot of you um, who I recognize. It's great to see so many friends on this screen. And it, it starts with your early support and encouragement for the work. And I'm just so in, incredibly <laughs> Um, to all of you and, and to the team at Bridge who um, they work so hard. Um, 
I'll just leave it right there for now. Thank you, Amber. You're welcome. Is any other members of the team want to say anything before I get started with our uh, with the questions that we've received from readers so far? If not, I'll get. I'll, well, let's get rolling right this into David Zeman. Go ahead, David. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was I was just going to say that we, we're really open to any questions um, uh, that you have. I, I mean, we we can talk about what our priorities are for the, this year, um, the the biggest stories we think we're going to be following. Uh, sometimes uh, what we plan for the year turns out to be completely different than what we thought it was. Witness 2020, uh, and um, but um, we we you know some of our best ideas come from come from readers uh, who alert us to things we never knew about, uh, and who also are not shy about alerting us to uh, um, to when when you think we're getting things wrong or are missing the real story or overplaying a particular angle to a story. So, uh, yeah, your candid thoughts are are really an important part of of this, at least for us. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, one of the, the first questions that we, I know I'm seeing a notice that my internet is being wonky, so alert me if you see that. Um, one of the questions that, that we received uh, first that I, that I think that would be fun to have John address on, on, this, on this call, because not everyone might understand what, what nonprofit news is. Uh, we received a few questions along the lines of, how do you generate revenue at, at Bridge Michigan? Um, does Bridge Michigan plan to do any additional um, uh, local additions? Uh, seeing the the advent of Bridge Detroit, um, kind of telling telling our readers a little bit how how the nonprofit news model works for for Bridge and sort of what our plans are um, as far as continuing to cover statewide and or local news. Thank you, Amber. Um, uh, just a little bit about nonprofit news and bridge. Um, we have more than a dozen uh, full-time professional journalists working on our team and a wide range of additional contributors, freelance writers, uh, photographers, uh, technical specialists, uh, a whole lot of money we spend on server space um, because the audience has gotten so large. Um, uh, our overall operation has a, a $3 million annual budget and that is funded through a mix of, of sources. Um, our founder, uh, the Power family, uh, Phil Power and Kathy Power, have made a, a commitment of a $1 million a year um, to the Center for Michigan and Bridge through the year 2030. It is their hope and expectation that um, our team um, uh, goes out and matches that um, by, by gaining philanthropic grants from Michigan's um, uh, uh, very large and, and very generous um, philanthropic community. Um, and the, the third leg on the stool is, is reader support. Um, and that's how we go from matching the power family commitment to um, doubling it. Um, uh, readers are, are doing an incredible job of helping us grow. And it really is the most important revenue source for us over the long term. Foundation grants come and go, and, and there's no guarantee that they will always continue. What we're trying to do uh, as an enterprise is recreate a, a true viable market for civic journalism and provide enough value to readers that they're willing to chip in for it. Um, the way uh, public broadcasting has worked for, for several decades now. Uh, your answer as readers is, is incredible. Um, you provided more than $700,000 in support to our work in 2020. Uh, it's just incredible. We're so grateful. Um, uh, I see on my screen my, my great friend and mentor, Ken, Ken Winter, the former publisher of the Petoskey News Review. Ken will remember the first time we asked uh, readers to support. It was in 2013 and they provided $10,000 in support that year. So that's a sense of how it is growing. Every dollar here, here is plowed back into the operation. We're nonprofit. Um, there is no exit strategy. There are no shareholders uh, we pay. There are no decisions that get made by a distant corporation. We're all invested in Michigan and invested in the enterprise and seeing it succeed, not just for today, this year, next year, but for the next generation. Um, nonprofit uh, also means that um, we're able to help sustain ourselves with, with philanthropic grants. 
And it also means that we are that part of that community from across the country that I talked about. We are sharing models together. We are sharing what we're learning. Um, we're growing together. And it, it's meant to be rooted in communities. We are rooted in Michigan. Our job is to do civic journalism. Our job is not to make a profit. Um, and that's why we're here. In terms of more local additions, boy, um, if, if only um, our abilities could could match uh, our, our obligations and, and our aspirations around the country. We've grown at warp speed over the past five years. Um, and um, uh, I'm not afraid to be vulnerable and say we're exhausted after 2020. Um, we're doing our best to renew ourselves and to continue to grow. Um, you will see reader surveys um, soon where we're asking for some guidance on some of the choices we have coming. Um, I want to leave it to our editors to talk about some of the expansions that they are considering here and get your feedback. Um, uh, in terms of local additions like Ann Arbor, we'd love to. We'd love to have more local additions. Um, it, it, it's a question of timing and scale. Um, our friends and peers and much respected colleagues in traditional newspapers, they're still going. They're not dead yet, and, and we, we don't want them to die. Um, so there's always a question for us of, do we want to compete in local markets or do we want to try to collaborate? And that's an ongoing unresolved issue for us. Bridge Detroit is our first huge experiment in local news delivery. Uh, we encourage you to all uh, read Bridge Detroit. It is editorially independent of Bridge Michigan. Um, and um, uh, there are two different experiments um, trying, to, trying to deliver uh, news to local communities. Fantastic. Thanks so much, John. I think that is a, a great overview and a way to great way to get us started. We received dozens of questions from readers and we're going to try to get to as many as we can today, as well as any additional questions you come up with today. One of the most popular topics that seemed to focus a lot of the questions and that you submitted were on politics and government. So one question that came up a few times was, um, it, I think it would be good to have a discussion and information about the redistricting commission is sort of what's the status of the redistricting commission um, for for our editors who are who are on this call what what's bridges plan to to cover this subject in 2021 uh, do you want me to take that one sure hi i'm joel kurth i'm the uh handle lansing coverage um and data coverage as well um, we're a little early on the redistricting commission, as most of you know, in 2018, the uh, voters of Michigan approved a 13 member um, nonpartisan uh, commission to um, redraw political maps uh, in Michigan. And that happens after the uh, census is completed, the, uh, the decennial census. And Donald Trump's administration slow walked the census results a little bit. And now we're not expecting to get the census um, out until the end of March. So I think the, re the redistricting commission has, has been um, uh, in, in they're sort of building up, hiring staff, hiring contractors right now. But we're really planning on looking, taking a deep look at, at how they're operating once they start drawing those lines, which should start, the process should really start in earnest um, this spring. And Michigan, as most of you know, is expected to lose a congressional district uh, going from 14 congressional um, seats to 13. So particularly in Southeast Michigan, it's gonna be very interesting to see how, uh, who gets edged out. Uh, there's a lot of thought that Andy Levin's uh, seat could be in jeopardy. Um, and so also the big question is whether the new districts can um, reverse a phenomenon in Michigan in which Democrats got the majority of votes for the House and the Senate and, um, and but continually did not, were not able to gain control of those, of those panels. Um, and Republicans, as you know, have said, hey, you know, this is just political geography. Nobody north of Bay City uh, is... Uh, a Democrat. So we're definitely planning on taking a deep look into that. Uh, if there's been a bit of a hurry up and wait, it's just because 
they're sort of hurrying up and waiting themselves. Excellent, thanks, Joel. Uh, another topic that we received quite a few questions about was sort of business as well as daily life in Michigan. There were quite a few questions that sort of fell into this um, this area, and so I wondered if Paula maybe could take a take a shot at one of the questions that we received. One of our readers asked, "As 2021 will certainly be a challenging year, I'd like to know how Bridge will be monitoring the." needs of individuals, families, businesses, and communities, and tracking how essentially how the state and municipalities and businesses are responding. I think a lot of this falls under the, the business watch beat. So I was wondering, if, Paula, if you could speak to this a bit. Sure. Yeah, a lot of it does fall under business, but it ends up um, um, just broadening to so many other aspects of our lives, as you, as you noted. Um, I take a lot of, um, I, I spend a lot of time looking at the data that comes out um, from the federal level and from the state level, and I try to find stories that are pertinent to readers. Um, there are more out there than we can ever handle. Um, one example that we haven't really um, delved into much this year is the eviction issue. Um, we've, we've had some coverage, but I think that's going to be emerging in 2021, um, along with real estate and other aspects of, of the pandemic that, that we just don't understand yet. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm watching what reports come out and how to build stories that reach both consumers and the business community and try to um, introduce a different voice into that too. So there are a lot of great publications in Michigan and what we're trying to do is tell something a little bit different business-wise. Um, and that's that's my big goal for, for this year. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Paula. This is one of those areas, uh, this is David Zeman, this is one of those areas where um, uh, uh, where we get a lot of wonderful uh, tips from readers in different parts of the state. Uh, play, you know, we can't be experts on every area, although we try to cover the state of Michigan uh, and, and we're going to be growing this year uh, in a better effort to, to do that. But um, uh, we find about, you know, finding out about small programs in, in different uh, regions of Michigan can help us connect the dots in a lot bigger ways, whether it's Paula doing it uh, or one of our state house reporters in Lansing uh, uh, doing it, uh, or we, it might be done through, you know, someone who handles uh, the environment or education. All of those uh, different beats that we have are implicated by the extreme stress that um, so many families are, are, are feeling uh, right now through this uh, pandemic uh, and the economic restrictions that have come with it. So um, again, it's, a, it's another pitch. We all have our, our emails on the website and, and you all have contacts with Amber. Um, uh, we love to hear about these things because it really can, a, a small program can open a large window into um, not only what kind of policy is helping people in Michigan, but, but, but how other places can, can adopt policies uh, of, uh, of a particular region. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, not surprisingly, we also received quite a few reader questions about um, health related issues, especially, especially surrounding coronavirus. Um, I'm not sure who wants to tackle this one, perhaps you, David. Um, there, we received a handful of questions about sort of our plan for covering vaccinations, the variants, the vaccination rollout, um, kind of how, how Bridge might be able to help people navigate the vaccine um, sign up process. I don't know who wants to take this one, but we received quite a few reader questions about this one, about this topic. Sure, and, and um, a, lo a lot of um, smart people, smarter, smarter than me, are, are saying we're still not sure. Um, as you know, we've written about it quite a bit, uh, mostly through Robin Herb, our, 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 uh, our health uh, reporter, but uh, everyone's sort of become a coronavirus reporter in the last uh, 10 or 12 months. So. Um, uh, most of this is happening through county health departments. Sometimes it's coordinated by the state, probably not as, as much as, uh, as experts would like it to be. I think our, our biggest mission this year um, is, is been doing what we have been doing through, through much of the pandemic, which is watchdogging the officials that we cover to see what kind of job they're doing. And that means the Whitmer administration. It means not only the governor, uh, but the, uh, um, but the uh, Health and Human Services uh, 
department, which has gone through a lot of a lot of changes. Um, uh, increasingly, uh, this year, uh, uh, you're going to see more of a federal response, uh, obviously, uh, with the Biden administration in there. Um, uh, but you know, it, it, it's been a it's been a problem for every state, and we've 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 tried when we when we could to. Uh, to provide people with links to, if nothing else, county health departments to get more answers or local hospitals, at least direct them to the right place because we have 83 counties and probably 83 uh, different methods uh, for distributing vaccines when they come in. Um, but we, we, we've also pushed, and we've shown a willingness to push through the last year um, to make uh, the Whitmer administration uh, uh, more transparent. Uh, which they have been reluctant to do. I mean, they're, they're, she's not the first administration to be reluctant to be transparent, but we have, uh, you know, really, um, really limited uh, 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 public uh, public document laws and and uh, and uh, and Freedom of Information Act requirements, and it has at times been uh, really uh, difficult to. To get information out of her administration, uh, uh, which we fought for throughout last year, including on more uh, more transparency as to what schools were being hit by um, uh, by COVID by COVID outbreaks, which nursing homes were being hit. At first, they did not want to name schools or school districts or individual nursing homes for Lord knows what reason. Um, but through enough. Um, uh, Pressure and stories. Uh, they eventually uh, did become more upfront about that. The um, uh, we're still trying to find out uh, why on earth uh, Robert Gordon uh, suddenly departed last last week as director of the of the uh, uh, state's top health agency. Um, so it, it has been sort of an ongoing um, uh, struggle uh, to get uh, real information, real data. Uh, out of uh, the Whitmer administration, uh, and um, and so that's that. You continuing to watchdog uh, what they can control in terms of vaccine distribution within the state is something that's sort of a priority for us going forward this year. I could just add to that too. Um, I, you know, before COVID, as a business reporter, I never had to deal with health departments, and it's been absolutely stunning to me how every county health department has their own operation and um, information that you'd think you'd be able to get from the state actually rests at the county level and they say it's not accessible. So one example for me in my reporting is I end up doing a lot of reporting on restaurants. Um, that's been an issue as, as um, businesses have been open and closed. That one kind of rose to the top over many, many months. Um, there are other states and I was talking to one of them today about that will tell you how many cases are within a single outbreak in Michigan, that information does not exist at the state level, at least that's what we're told. So there's this big piece of information out there that just doesn't exist for us to tell in our reporting. Thank, thank you, Paula and David. Um, surely like no other issue since Bridge has been around. Um, Bridge has really relied on reader questions, tips and feedback over the past year. Um, it's helped us in so many ways determine just how to approach the enormity of it every day. Um, one colleague I don't think we've mentioned yet is Mike Wilkinson, who is our data specialist. Um, his very, from day one, he's been producing our coronavirus dashboard. Um, uh, we're continuing to tweak that. It, 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 it's the snapshot that our reader, our reader metrics are showing um, a whole lot of people in Michigan wake up every day uh, to look at those numbers, whether it is um, testing rates or positivity rates. And now focus switch, switching to um, all the virus data. Um, Mike has maps color coded by county. Uh, you, you can trace any piece of data that we can get out of the state. Um, and and um, he, Mike, Mike also has done a great job of interacting with readers who ask questions. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that want to go deeper than what we're presenting. And, and Mike's eager for that kind of engagement. So again, just encouraging every bridge reader and all of you here, keep us honest. Let us know what we're missing. We, we need your guidance. 
I, I see a question in the chat that before we move on to some more topical questions, I think probably any person, any of our speakers could take on this question and probably have a lot to say about it. Denise asked, how do you decide what to cover in general? How do we make decisions about what we cover at Bridge? Uh, yeah, that's it. it, it, it. It is a, 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 can be a challenge because we're covering an entire state. Most of us came from um, uh, big metro papers, Detroit Free Press or Detroit News, uh, you know, uh, uh, or M Live, um, and so we're, we were covering a region. And so um, uh, we, it, it, it's it, it's a combination of uh, readers talking to their sources every day. Uh, and going out and making phone calls every day and and uh, and pitching story ideas, but also editors asking about story ideas and re it, it's another three legged stool, as John likes to say and 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 the information that we get from readers sometimes there'll be a um, uh, a big national story on uh, something having to do with covid and we'll just steal the idea, uh, and not steal the story, but steal the idea and, and make it relevant um, uh, to Michigan. Uh, so uh, it's a combination of those three things. We, we meet every morning and we talk about where we're at and what stories uh, are coming that day and for the rest of that week. And uh, just talking among one another often, often, um, uh, often uh, improves our, our storytelling and gives us ideas that we didn't have. The reporters brainstorm on their own and together with each other. Uh, oftentimes are engaged in partnerships with other news organizations. Uh, and so we will talk with them as well. That's very much part of our DNA and something that we're used to doing. Um, so, uh, but you know, the best ideas tend to come from the reporters uh, because they're the ones talking to the people on their beats uh, every day and one thing we try to do is try to get people out of their own regions. If a particular reporter lives in Metro Detroit, they you know, they know that they're expected to be uh, not only calling people in other regions of the state, but traveling to other regions of, of the state so that we can give a more intimate um, intimate account of, of what of what's happening in different places. And um, uh, thankfully, uh, readers uh, seem to appreciate the stories that are a, a, a good deal away from our urban centers, um, and so uh, and so that's really exciting for our reporters to travel and, and see new places. We have our, our one of our Lansing reporters right now up in the in the Upper Peninsula uh, uh, reporting a story, um, and so it, it's really um, really something that's energizing for them, and uh, it appears to be energizing for readers as well because those are some of our best read stories. Uh, when when we go to different places that aren't written about quite a bit and, and highlight the issues and policies impacting them. Thank you, David. There's a couple uh, other elements that, that readers might be interested in. Um, one is technology and another is planning. We, we try to ground our work in a, a flat organizational approach to really inclusive decision making. Um, we go through weeks of of strategic planning at the end of every year uh, and, and different from from corporations and for-profit uh, media um, we're engaged top to bottom in what the budget priority should be we we take a, a a fresh look at what our beat structure should be every year who, what we should be covering what we're not covering and and, and how to try to uh, get additional resources to do it so we, we try to we start we try to stay grounded in in a plan. Um, uh, our 2020 plan did not survive mid-March. <laughs> we know that and sometimes plans are folly, but we, we do try to uh, always always be grounded in a, in a sense of mission that's shared across the team. And the other one is technology. I, I think Bill Emko, our growth strategist, is, is in here somewhere. There he is. I see him down here somewhere. Um, Bill comes to our morning meeting every day with a reams of data about what people are searching for across Michigan on Google right now. Um, what what the topics are that are hot now? Sometimes they they are about the Mega Millions jackpot winner or or um, some sports figure. But we do look for intersections between the Bridge coverage mission and what people are looking for. And I've been amazed at how Bridge Paula is especially adept at this. Uh, how quickly um, Bridge endeavors to adapt to what people are searching for and be relevant. Uh, 
relevance is a key word here. We, we want to be relevant um, and we want to help readers navigate life in these crazy times. Um, another technology we use, which has been really important in, in COVID, we're all working remotely um, every day. We've, we've seen each other once as a group um, in October at an out, outdoor fire pit, um, safely, safely socially distanced. It's um, boy, it's it's such a challenge to find togetherness, um, and I think it's a testament to the team of people here that that they've overcome that. But there is a just a river of 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 commentary and and problem solving that also happens through through um, uh, Slack, which is a, a messaging uh, technology that are, and a, you know kind of a workflow technology that our team uses. Um, technology, we we couldn't do bridge without technology. One other thing I'd add to that is, um, you know, I started in April. I never worked at Bridge without COVID. And all of my conversations before starting here involved me writing classic Bridge stories. And what the classic Bridge story has, um, it, it's evolved. It, it's really clear to me that it's evolved. I think um, the, the thing that I see here now is immediacy that maybe didn't exist as much before COVID. And I think we'd all, value your feedback on that you know do you look to us for breaking news or immediacy and where you know because we have to navigate where that fits in um with our planning and also you know when do we drop everything and tell that story that's that's happening immediately that's a great point paula and if people have feedback on that please type it into the chat we'd love to see it or follow up with me after after this event I'm taking a look at our list of questions and I wanna make sure we can get through as many as possible. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move us to a next question that fits into um, what I see in the chat, but also one that we received ahead of time. Um, you know, naturally, because of population centers, a lot of our coverage focuses on, on um, events and, and things that are happening in our metropolitan centers. Um, but we've received a few questions about our rural coverage, particularly rural poverty. Um, what's our coverage plan around those issues? We are covering it. <laughs> um, you know, as David mentioned, we have um, Jonathan Osting, who is our capital reporter extraordinaire, is in Calumet um, right now working on a story about um, uh, extremism. Uh, uh, after this call, I'm getting on another call with uh, Ted Roloffs, who covers social service issues uh, for us, um, and he is... Um, working on a collaboration regarding um, elder care and how that's been affected by the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And we're placing an emphasis on, um, you know, uh, geographic diversity in that. I think, you know, we always try to, um, you know, we have reporters in, in Lansing, Southeast Michigan, um, Ann Arbor and um, West Michigan. And we, we always try to tell stories through different lenses and different experiences in hopes of um, broaching that, that commonality. Because, you know, as we've told, you know, a lot of the poverty issues and the disability and the healthcare issues in, you know, the Northern and Lower Peninsula, particularly on the East Coast are similar to ones in Southeast Michigan and the Down River area. So we, we think those stories resonate and we plan on uh, continuing to do them as much as possible. And I'm trying to grab some of that through business too. One of my earliest stories um, was taking a look at Michigan's unemployment and how it differed by county and how the nor Northeast Lower Peninsula had a different situation. And I, I delved into that a little bit. Um, and I went to Everett uh, where um, they lost a single factory and tried to tell the story about what it meant to that community. Um, I'll be doing more of that as I look at economic forecasting because it's really clear that there's two types of, of recovery happening in Michigan. Um, it's the low wage, low education worker versus the rest of us who may not actually feel too much of a recession right now. Um, so, and, and I see um, Nancy, you mentioned the 2021 analyst report. Um, that's one of the reports that I've actually been spending some time in and do plan on some coverage of um, both what we already know through Alice and then the new report. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Uh, one topic we haven't touched on yet, but one that Bridge covers a lot is education. 
One reader question we received asked, um, they said education at every level was of course rocked by the pandemic. Um, this person notes in particular special education and students that are receiving special education, they say may never regain the lost year. Will we be covering this topic? Yes, we 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 have and we will. Um, there's a you know there's a, a one of the perennial fights that's going to be an even starker relief this year is the idea of how to fund uh, schools and what school districts get more uh, and what school districts deserve more. And there's a whole question between the a whole divide between the Republicans in the legislature and the governor and the Biden administration in terms of more equitably funding. Uh, districts and that that involves um, uh, uh, giving uh, people who, who who support that believe in in giving more support, more investment in districts that have a higher degree of of um, higher number of uh, vulnerable students, either in terms of uh, poverty or some other uh, social uh, factors, um, and that they need more support in order to you know to to um, uh, to, to get the same benefit from their uh, education uh, as kids in more affluent um, districts. And this is one of those issues, and there's a number of them at Bridge, but this is one of those issues where we really have an opportunity as a news organization um, uh, to create some intersections between very different populations. Um, many of the same um, problems that afflict kids in poor sections of Detroit or Flint or Saginaw, um, uh, uh, such as uh, lack of transportation, uh, lack of internet connection at home, that sort of thing, afflict uh, uh, lower income kids in rural areas of the state, including in the UP. So, so you know, we, we, we live for those sorts of, um, of, for covering those sorts of policy issues where we can show how very different populations, whether they be white and black or uh, red or blue states or blue you know, uh, regions, um, really have a, a lot in common in what they need or what they don't need from their government on a state or federal level. And so um, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why we, we travel through so much of the state is to, is to uh, look at things in a way that gets beyond partisanship to, uh, you know, in, in what areas can public policy uh, help very different kinds of people uh, who have some of, some of the very same problems. So uh, equity, uh, uh, how funds are going to be dispensed. Certainly it looks like, uh, uh, and Joel probably talked to this better than I can, it looks like uh, the governor and, uh, and state Republicans uh, are on the same page in the sense of uh, recognizing the need for extra funding to help all kinds of kids. I mean, even the most uh, advantaged kids are um, are suffering from being home and working on a computer or a tablet or whatever and not being with their friends and even more so for, for the rest. So there, is, there does seem to be a, 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 a shared value in, in extending more funding to education, but how that's distributed, uh, uh, Joel, I don't know, even know if you've been on top of, of that uh, so far, um, how that's distributed is um, something that's an open question as they as they start negotiations on the budget. Yes, sir. I think you covered it very well. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. This next question, I think, Paula, is a good one for you because I think I will, I remember you saying that this is something that you're planning to look into. Uh, one of our readers asked if we have any plans to cover the pandemic's well-documented uh, disproportionate impact on women in the workforce. The data, they say, is shocking and has serious implications for the talent pipeline. Yeah, that story actually is, is underway right now. Um, and that's that's part of the evolution of business coverage and and how we work at Bridge. Um, you know, early on on a weekly basis, unemployment was very very interesting, right? It was changing quickly, and getting those numbers and reflecting it as it um, as it just leapt higher and then started to come down, and what it meant in terms of like how the state was was open or not for business. You know, that was a very very immediate measure. Um, but over time, like we've, we've pulled back on that and we're trying to take a look at other aspects of employment, you know, who's coming out of the workforce, who's unemployed, who's not likely to get back to work quickly. Um, and, and the women in the workforce is, is one of those issues that, 
other places have told it and you know we know it exists out there but it's time for bridge to take that look from michigan and say what does it mean for us here now and that story is in the pipeline right now fantastic uh one topic that we haven't touched on today but um for which there have been uh some big updates in 2020 uh one reader wondered about our plan uh, for covering criminal justice reform because there were so many changes in 2020 um, and wondering if that was going to be a continued focus of coverage in 2021. Uh, you know, I would say uh, uh, candidly, uh, we cover criminal justice reform um, sporadically. Um, since I uh, uh, came here as editors, like, I don't know what, eight, seven, eight years ago, uh, we've more than doubled our staff. Um, and yet, if you ask any of the editors or any of the reporters, you could say, you know, if, if, if 10 new positions were funded and opened, we could, we could easily uh, uh, assign them to different beats because we should. Uh, criminal justice is, is, uh, is one of them. Um, uh, we do an okay job of covering it, but we need to cover it more, more consistently. Um, it's particularly so because, I mean, even if you um, put aside the racial reckoning conversations that have happened over the last two or three years, um, um, it, 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 it's, it, it, which feeds into it, obviously, um, it, there's been such a huge amount of um, bipartisan support, not just in Michigan, but in, in, in states across much of the country, uh, on the need for... Um, criminal justice reform and making sure that the, the people that are incarcerated really need to be incarcerated to make sure that we don't uh, uh, doom them to, to ending back in jail by not giving them the tools that they need when they are in, in, in prison in order to come out by, uh, by passing these, uh, these laws that keep, um, you know, that, that allow uh, certain people who've had a, uh, a, uh, a criminal history uh, to, to to, to, you know, to get, give them a sort of a, a, a clean slate when they're trying to get back into the job market. And that's, and, and uh, you know, for the last five or six years, um, re Republicans have been a real major uh, force in that um, uh, and, and working with, 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 um, with Democrats. And this, it really started in a place, a surprising place in Texas. Uh, Republicans were for criminal justice reform and, and and uh, I think it gave a lot of uh, other Republicans in other states some cover um, uh, to consider these uh, reforms as well. And so we need to do a better job of covering it. And it's, it's certainly a, a, a big part of, um, uh, 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 the, uh, of really bold changes that are happening in Michigan over the last year. Excellent. Um, I'm seeing a few, one topic we haven't touched on at all today are in, is the environment. And we received, just received a, a question from Jan in the chat. And we also received one ahead of time that were, were environmentally focused. Just wondering if we could talk a little bit about so, what some of our plans for environmental coverage are. Um, and the questions we received were specifically about um, individual community efforts in the area of renewable energy and also received a question about continuing to cover the delisting of the gray wolf as an endangered species in Michigan. So just wondering if we've got any plans to cover in either of those areas or generally what our environmental coverage plans are for the year. Amber, Amber tying that back to what David just said, um, what David was talking about is kind of a constant struggle here of trying to look for where we need to go next and, and grow. Um, we have a platoon, we could use a whole army. Um, uh, but Environment Watch is an example of, of how reader questions steadily bubble up and we say, wow, we, we need to devote a full-time effort here. Um, Michigan Environment Watch is now, I think in its fourth year. Um, Jim Malowitz was a full-time reporter for us who came to us from Texas Tribune, which is the largest nonprofit news operation in the country. Jim then went on to um, his wife's hometown of Madison, Wisconsin, and is a, a, a leading editor at um, Wisconsin Watch, which is a sister publication there. And we were very fortunate um, about a year ago to attract Kelly House, a Michigan native and a Michigan State University graduate, um, to come home from the Portland, Oregonian, where she was winning national awards as environmental reporter. Um, 
I'll leave it to David now to talk about the, the very expansive um, agenda that Kelly has for this year. Yeah, so uh, w w one of the things that that uh, that we're doing is we we're uh, we're engaged in a really huge project, a collaboration um, that was made possible from uh, funding from the Mott Foundation in Flint uh, to cover uh, water issues uh, in Michigan. Um, as with so much of our funding, some people, some of our funders just give to our general operations, uh, and some of us and some. Uh, uh, also give money to particular subject matters um, um, that that we're interested in covering, and you know it's important to note. I think you I think you all know this, but it's important to note that while we you know uh, are, are funded to do certain things, our funders are not involved in how we do them, what we say, what we find, what we report out. Uh, that is done uh, independently by by our edit, editorial staff. Um, so right now, Robin is involved in, in um, looking uh, in a project that really looks to um, uh, the, the future of Michigan's water, uh, uh, where we're going to be uh, in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, as we anticipate people coming from other parts, more parched areas of the US coming to uh, places like Michigan and the Great Lakes. Uh, because of its uh, abundant uh, water supply, and and are we ready for that sort of changing demographics? And so uh, she's uh, um, working with a with a great uh, 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 journalism environmental journalism operation called C uh, Circle of Blue, uh, and also with our friends at uh, at Michigan Radio, um, and who else, John? I'm blanking. Detroit Public TV. Detroit Public TV, thank you, uh, on a series of, of stories uh, uh, examining the, 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 the future of our waters and, and how to write about water, you know, water issues aside from the Line 5 issue involving uh, Enbridge in, in, the, in the Straits of Mackinac. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of the, the wolf coverage, uh, that was the, terrific stories. That was uh, from a freelancer named John Barnes. Uh, who used to work for uh, uh, M Live, the news organization M Live, which is where Paula came from, uh, and he has uh, been uh, sort of um, driving people at DNR crazy over the years by foying uh, information from them, uh, often taking many months uh, and and a lot of expense to get, and, and that information invariably uh, 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 reveals. Uh, um, that what they that what the state has been saying publicly about their motivations for hunting wolves and so forth is is diametrically opposed to what the what the documents actually tell us their real reasons are and so um, uh, there you know there's a number number of changes I don't know if it's going to be reversed what what uh, the delist, delisting of of wolves as a protected uh, species the gray wolves in Michigan uh, I don't know what the future of that is but uh, but we're we're certainly um, uh, going to be monitoring that and, and and seeing what that does to the the sort of uh, 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 revamped wolf population uh, in the UP to see if that's affected. Um, I'm just piling on, David, I'm, because I'm noticing a, a couple more environmental questions in the in the chat stream um, from Jan. Jan asked about um, covering the septic code. Um, that's an example of, of a phrase we use around here. Re readers don't have archives. Um, when, when we all worked in newspapers, we had big libraries where we could go back and look up any story ever written. Um, and in the internet age, re readers don't have archives. Um, Jan, that's a great question, and it's an issue we return to again and again here. I think Bridge did its first story about the, the septic code and the, the threats of that in 2011. I think Jeff Alexander, who used to be at the Muskegon Chronicle, wrote that for us. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did a public engagement campaign about um, statewide water issues and a lengthy part of the issue guide there was about the septic code. Um, there are perennial issues that we will continue to return to in our coverage, um, probably until um, the, the day we all uh, um, retire. But um, uh, that's a great example and you can never do enough on any one of these issues. We So many issues on any topic in Michigan are, are perpetual and, and delayed right now. COVID has taken the air out of so many things. Um, uh, 
there's a lot of us who are eager to get back to some of the policy issues we were confronting um, uh, before, before the world turned upside down. Excellent. We're coming up um, toward the end of the hour here, so I'm going to try and just speed round through a few of the additional questions that we've received. Joel, maybe I can I can turn to you to just talk about sort of what's coming next for politics and government. Uh, we get a lot of questions about kind of what what is the Michigan GOP? Um, what are their plans post this election? You know, are are things are is their focus going to change or not? Um, got also questions about sort of the uh, Representative Wentworth stated goal of focusing on ethics reform and whether we're planning on, on looking at that. Um, maybe you could just give us an, an outlook about what you think we're going well, to look at. I mean, those uh, are great questions and that. very timely. Uh, Jonathan Osting is sitting down with uh, Speaker Wentworth this afternoon. So make sure you open your browsers tomorrow to talk, uh, see what his agenda is going to be. Um, he's been, he's much, um, uh, more media shy than his predecessors. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't even have Twitter. How crazy is that in this day and age? Um, obviously, uh, the future of the GOP is going to be a theme that we're going to be continuing to explore um, you know, throughout the year. I think there's a reckoning going on with the party right now. Um, Madeline Halpert, who has uh, graced us as a, a sort of a temporary writer for us. Um, has a story that should be coming out this week um, about about that schism in the uh, in the GOP. Um, there's a lot of folks who are saying that um, you know the party can't really move on until it acknowledges the harm it did um, by sticking with Trump. And uh, so far, the uh, answer seems to be, eh, no. Um, we're going to continue to punish people who stood up to Trump. Um, and so that is uh, obviously a theme that we're going to develop um, over the years as whether the GOP becomes, um, you know, sort of snaps back to the party <laughs> conservatism that they used to be, or if they devolve further into the, to the party of Trump, um, even though he's, he's out of office. So that in the obvious, the frictions between uh, um, Republicans in Whitmer as it relates to coronavirus policy, um, and whether or not that impacts the state budget priorities is going to be a um, theme that's going to play out again and again and again. That said, I do think that, you know, for the short term anyway, um, COVID and the vaccine is going to continue to dominate all public policy conversations in Michigan for the next six to nine months. Excellent. I... I'm looking at our, our list of questions and, and the chat. It's 1255. Um, before we, I turn it over to Catherine Dougal to do our closing remarks. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground today, but I wanted to make sure since we've got four of our leaders on this call that if there is anything that any of you wanted to say to readers before we closed out for the day that I gave you a chance to do so before um, Catherine closes our discussion for the day. So I guess if you do, the floor is yours. We love you. <laughs> if you uh, I think we say it a lot, but you know, if you guys uh, have opinions about what is not being covered, but should be covered, I think uh, Amber put our emails up there. Um, you know, I think especially during the, the pandemic, we've been uh, tunnel, tunnel, tunnel focused, but I think that, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And um, please let us know if you think that we're missing the ball on things and can do it, can improve, and we get better because because of uh, because of our readers, who we think are the smartest audience in Michigan. One thing in particular that I would like to hear actually is. Um, it, you know, I know there's a hunger for good news. Um, and as a business reporter, I often don't write good news, um, but it's out there and it exists. And if there's something that you hear uh, that you think is telling about the state and that deserves, um, deserves a place on bridge, please let me know. Um, I could use your help with that. I got Anyone else? To share my gratitude one more time. Um, we love you, Bridge Readers. We need you. We need your guidance. We need your 
advice and support. And um, we're in this for the long term, not today, tomorrow, but the next generation. Thank you for all you do to help us. All right, Catherine, you want to bring us home? All right, thanks, Amber. And thank you, everyone who joined us today. Um, we really appreciate all of you taking some time out of your afternoon, especially those bridge members. Um, thank you, John, David, Joel, and Paula for sharing some insights with us about what people can expect for the year ahead. Um, as, a reminding, as a reminder to you, we will be posting this video in Bridges edition tomorrow. Um, so if you want to revisit this conversation or share it with someone, there will be a link tomorrow. Um, as a reminder, also, these conversations take place each month, um, normally towards the end of the month, and generally, we focus on different policy issues. So if you have some ideas for what kind of conversations you'd like to see with our staff going forward, feel free to send one of us an email, or you can send it through the contact form on our website. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and have an excellent day. Thanks, all. Take care.